Uh, I'm a student ministries pastor at a, ch- a church called Christ Church of the Valley uh, in San Dimas, just down the freeway. And uh, I would love just to kind of introduce myself just a little bit before we dive into today's message. Um, I, I've been a pastor for the, about, uh, the last 10 years or so. Uh, majority of that time hanging out with junior high and high school students, but uh, I do get to rotate and they throw me in with the adults on, on a, a pretty uh, good rotation at my church as well. And I, one of my favorite things, I really do love just to teach the Bible and, and how it does apply to our lives. Um, um, I'm married, uh, been married for five years to a wonderful lady named Kristen. Um, she's the best. And obviously we have a, a baby boy, he's eight month old, um, and his name is Graham. Look at that face, guys. Um, you know what that face says? Trouble. Um, <laughs> just a smirk of like, I know what I'm going to do. Um, a little known fact um, about my wife and I, we met in 2005 uh, on Maui. Uh, so like in Hawaii, and I know what some of the women are thinking, they're like, oh, like the bachelor. And I wouldn't know, I don't watch trash. Um, and it's, it's just something, you know, it's, it's true, it's not good for you. Um, but not only did we meet on Maui, but we met in a hot tub. Um, so like every guy in the room is going like, air high five, what's up? Um, and so we met, but here's the thing, even though we met in 2005, we didn't start dating until 2008 because she put me in this thing called the dreaded friend zone. Um, and if you don't know what the friend zone is, let me explain it to you um, because it's something that every woman is born knowing how to do. Um, and what happens is they string along a guy that they like uh, for years um, and they say stuff like this, uh, I love you like a brother. You're such a great friend. Or I wish there was more guys like you. And you're like, I am a guy like me. Um, and so they do that kind of stuff. Um, and and let me, guys, let me just tell you, if that's you, let me just tell you, there's hope. Um, because you can get out. Uh, I got out. We had a baby. I won, right? And so we're, there's hope. And girls, ladies, stop it. You know what you're doing. You know exactly what you're doing. So, um, guys, I'm just so excited to be here with you. I'm honored to be here uh, with you. So let's, let, can we just pray? And then let's dive into this message as we continue um, this series of the God I wish you knew. Uh, Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. God, we thank you for this time that we get to be here and we get to worship you. God, that we get to, to open up your word and that you get to teach us and convict us. And, and God, as we talk about a, a pretty... A pretty tough topic today, God, of what is it, what happens in, when we're in our toughest times? God, do we turn to you or do we turn to something else? God, I, I pray that today that we could be challenged and we could move towards you, just one step closer to you today. God, we pray this in your name. Amen. Now let me ask you a very important question, at least it's important to me. Uh, who loves Food. Raise your hand if you just love food. Okay, now, here's the thing. I'm not talking about food. Like, I love food and the fact that if I don't have food, I'm going to die. Like, that's not the kind of the type of love that I'm talking about. I'm talking about, like, you love food so much that as you're eating your current meal, you're already thinking about your next meal as you're eating the meal that you're currently eating. Like, that's, let, me see those, let me see those people. Not just like, I'm going to die if I don't eat. Okay. Food. I, I, like, I love food. If people, if people, oh, the question where do you want to go to eat? It's not just a casual question to me. Like this is a very important question to me. Like I love burgers, like just a big fat juicy burger. I want it. I love sweets, double stuffed Oreos all day long. See, I, I, I even take some veggies if there's like smothered in butter, um, do all those things. See, food is a really big deal to me. And then when we decide on where we go for dinner, it's not just a casual decision. It's like a very thought out calculated process because I know that wherever we go to dinner is there needs to be a dessert place within walking distance. That's also the same distance between a coffee shop. Because it's not just a decision, it is a journey that we're all going on. And it's a very important one that I feel like the biggest fights that my wife and I get into has to do with this question. Maybe there's couples in here that do the same thing. Is the, big, the question is, where do you want to eat? Because I know exactly where I want to eat. And my wife says, well, you just choose. And then I always say, no, because you never want to go where I want to go. And then she's like, no, you just choose. And I say, well, I want to go to Eureka Burger. She's like, I don't want to do that. And it goes back and forth like six times and then we end up going to some salad place that I don't even want, right? Because she wins always. Um, so food matters. It's a big deal. One, it's a big deal because, you know, you need it to live. But two, it's a big deal because 
you know, I, you have a place that you love to eat. Like, I have a favorite restaurant, Eureka Burger. It's my favorite. I, I will choose to go there almost every single time. Chick-fil-A reigns supreme in everything that I do. Anywhere that I want to go. That when it comes to our favorite places to eat, like we're so loyal to those places that when sometimes, even though it's not good, maybe the service was bad one day or the food came out cold another day, like we'll constantly give that place, we'll go back to that place and we're loyal to that place because it's a place that we love and that we'll defend it. And when people don't want to go to that place, you almost become offended because they're like, how dare you not like Chick-fil-A? It's the holy chicken. Right? Like this is like the Christian chicken. We need, we need to go there. And still, no matter how many times Chick-fil-A messes up or if they mess up something, I will, oh, it will always be one of my favorite places to eat. Now, here's the deal. When it comes to our faith, when sometimes it doesn't feel, like even though like restaurants have messed up, when it comes to God and our faith and when he doesn't do the things that we feel like he should do, why, why is it sometimes that faith is usually the first thing to go? That sometimes, come on, like, right, we could be honest in this place that if we have more faith and loyalty to like local restaurants than we do, than we have our put faith into God and this believing in who he says he says he is. That we're so quick to drop God when things go bad, but we'll continue to go to our favorite places to eat, even if we have a bad experience. And how come we're so quick to drop our faith or wrestle with our faith or question our faith or rethink our faith when God is not doing the things that we think he should be doing, yet we'll keep on going to the, serve, the place that keeps on giving us bad service because that's our, we're loyal to that place. See, sometimes I feel like we're more loyal to a brand than we are to our faith. So you stay with me. I, I, I think that, think about, just take a moment, just take, take a, a, an inventory of the things that matter most to you. Think about the people, think about things, places, whatever, whatever matters most to you. That life could be so good, right? One minute where you're, it's going this way and things are good and you're thanking God and you're praising God for all these things. And then all of a sudden you get that news or that thing at work or the, the thing in your marriage or the financial thing. And then all of a sudden life switches from good and in an instant it goes to bad. And in the moment that the life change happens, the things that matter most to us change. That when things go bad, it's easy to forget about God and our faith and pretend like he doesn't even matter. See, I won't lie to you. It's hard to determine what truly matters when things get a little bit rocky, right? Like, I think I'm here today to remind some people in this room, and let's be honest, I'll even need to remind, I'm preaching to myself that God still does matter and that you matter to him still. See, think about again, think of what matters in this life, like, right? Food matters. We already established that. It's more than just like, I want to survive, but like it matters to me and I'm passionate about where I go to eat. Water matters, right? If we don't have that, we're gone. Purpose matters. To know why you were placed here on this earth matters. Knowing that you are not just living life to exist, but you're actually thriving in the life. So purpose actually matters. Uh, relationships matter because you know for a fact if you're in bad relationships, bad stuff happens around those things. So healthy relationships are a very good thing. And like love matters. See, life gets hard, but it's so easy sometimes to say, well, life and God and faith doesn't really matter. Why? Because here's, here's what I've kind of deemed it to. It's easier to change your beliefs than it is to change your behavior. That it's easier to, to change what you believe than it is to change your behavior. See, I think it's easy. The e it's the easy way out to say, well, I just don't believe that anymore. I'm just, I just don't believe that God doesn't really matter anymore to me because I thought he was going to do this, but now he's not going to do this thing. And so I'm just not going to do this whole faith thing anymore. It doesn't matter apparently. We just kind of drop it, our faith, like we would a restaurant that we just choose to not like anymore. See, and as a Jesus follower, and here, here's the thing, I know that not everyone in this room is a, a follower of Jesus, and that's totally great, and we're just glad that you're here in this place. But a, a, a Jesus follower, you know that in, in the, it's in the deepest and toughest and darkest times is where we need to grab onto Jesus and his life-giving words the most. Because it matters. You know how I know this? Because I've gone through it. Like, can we be honest in this place, Active Church? Like, this is a place where we could be honest with each other and, like, kind of be transparent. 
The, three, the last three years of my life, I would say has been the most difficult times of my life. It's been, it's been a pretty rough go. In the last three years, my mom came out to be a major alcoholic. Like you ever see the show A&E Intervention? Like where people go and they confront the people that are doing damage to them and the family members and friends around them. Like I led an intervention for my mom. And she went into rehab. She came out of rehab. A month later, relapsed. You know, thankfully now, you know, by the grace of God, she just got her year chip um, like a, uh, a month ago. And it's awesome to see what God is doing in her life. But just, you know, just like anything, any decision, there, you don't get away from the consequences and just the years of, of the alcoholism. Now my parents are going through a nasty divorce. And at 31, it still sucks. It's still, it's still tough. And because of this, there's tensions in the family. So brothers and sisters aren't talking to each other and not talking to some parent. And there's just all this mess that's happening in between all this stuff. This, even this year, I, I got overlooked for a job that I thought I should have. So I started dealing with like identity issues and kind of like, am I good enough? And walking through that kind of things. And even on top of all of that, probably because of all the things that are happening, that I, I end up getting, I, I suffer with anxiety and I go to therapy because of it. Ooh, it's a lot. See, I, I would be lying to you up here up on the stage if there were times in the last few years where I did not wrestle with my faith, where I didn't begin to think about the idea of just changing what I believe instead of facing what Jesus actually teaches and doing the thing that Jesus calls me to do in the midst of all the conversations and the hurt and the pain and the frustration and the anxiety and the struggles and all, all those kind of things. See, how Jesus works in our lives, and let's be honest, how, how sometimes we feel like he does not seem to be working in our lives is it can be frustrating. And sometimes he says to do things that just doesn't make sense and it's hard to remain faithful in these difficult times, is it not? See, thankfully... The guys who followed Jesus the closest, his disciples, his 12, who, the guys who remember who literally physically saw Jesus do the things that, he, that we only read about, but they were there to watch his miracles and hear the words come out of his mouth. And those guys that, that followed him along for those three years, they too struggled with following Jesus and doing the things that he called them to do. See, this is why I love scripture, because it's about, about real people with real emotions and real frustrations in the same way that we struggle with following Jesus today. And, and they too had to wrestle with the question, does God matter to them? Or are they going to, because they were saying that they were following someone who literally said he was God with flesh on. And they had to come to wrestle with, am I going to follow this guy and follow him even though it gets hard? Or am I going to just change what I believe? And what, what they would do with this decision would literally make or break them. And they were questioning too. And I think that we can learn from their response in the situation. So let me set the scene here before we dive in. We're going to be in John 6. If you open up your Bibles or flip to it, turn on the app, whatever it is that you do to, to read the Bible. But let me just set the scene for you. So Jesus, he just got done teaching. He's in this huge crowd. And he just literally fed 5,000 people with the little boy's Happy Meal. Right? So everyone's happy and they're full because they're not hangry anymore. They're just ready to go because Jesus literally fed them and they want more. And so Jesus, he needed to get away from the crowd. So he sends his disciples across the lake on a boat and he goes off to pray. But then he was trying to get away from the crowds too. So he ends up walking on the water out to his disciples, which is awesome. And then they get to the other side of the lake and the crowd literally followed him across the lake. And they met him there. But they didn't want to hear Jesus' teaching. It's not why they were following him. They were following him because he fed them. He fed them like with food. And they were continuing to be hungry because I'm not going to lie to you. If someone's passing out free Chipotle burritos, I'm going to be following that person wherever he goes. <laughs> like just a little side note. Last night I went to Chipotle. This is, miracles still happen. Okay. Um, went to Chipotle, bought food for like six people for the small group that I'm in. And I went there, the computer froze. And they just said, here, you have all of it for free. Love it. 
made my night. Remember, remember we just talked about, I just, I love food. I don't know if you know that. I love food. That was a great night. Did I get the chips and, uh, the chips and guac? Yes, I did. Um, and so it was, it was amazing. But this is why people were following Jesus because he just got done feeding him and he calls them out on it. He calls them and he says, you're not here to follow me or to hear my teaching. You're just following me because, because I fed you. And he goes on to teach them where he says that, he says, I am the bread of life. And he begins to teach them and he begins to say certain things and confront them with this teaching that they did not like. And then all of the crowds begin to disperse. And we'll dive into the bread of life here in a little bit, but I'm more interested in the disciples' response. Because then he, because the crowd goes away, Jesus t- turns to his disciples, his, his followers, and he asks them the same question. And he says, do you want to leave too? Things are getting tough. Do you want to leave also? And I love the response of the disciples, starting in verse 16, John chapter 6. It says, on, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is hard teaching. Who can accept it? How many of us, when confronted, when, when we go about our lives and decisions that we need to, to make, when we con- 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 come confronted with what we hear about Jesus' teaching, that we ask the very same question, like, can I really do this? Do I really have to do this? God, because this is hard. What you're asking me to do right now, you're asking me to forgive. You're asking me to go confront. You're asking me to follow. You're asking me to do these things. Like, God, this is hard. Who can truly accept it? Are you really asking me to do this thing? And many people begin to stop following Jesus. Why? Because it's way easier to change your beliefs than it is to change your behavior. See, for many of us, this is true, because look what happens in John uh, 6, starting in 61. It says, aware that his disciples were, were grumbling about this, Jesus said to him, does this offend you? Then if you see that the Son of Man ascend to where he was before, the Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing, and the words that I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. And he went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. Verse 66, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. See, many people in their lives, when confronted with the teachings of Jesus, They come to a crossroads. It's change what I believe or do what he says. Change what I believe, it's easier. I just don't do that anymore. That's not my thing anymore. Or actually begin to do what he's called us to do. See, how many people know, or maybe you go with this title as well, but you, you, you know, you go with the title of Christian, right? Someone says, oh, what are, I'm a Christian. What I'm asking you, Active Church, today is to get rid of that title. I'm asking you to, instead of, and replace Christian with the word disciple. Because I want to bring a little bit more clarity to this word Christian, because what it actually means, because so for so many of us, being Christian has merely, just means merely believing a certain amount of things to be true, and then if we believe those things, then we're Christian. But the superficial meaning of Christian has created problems essentially like we have a lot of Christians who don't look anything like the teachings of Jesus or resemble what he calls a disciple to actually do. That the word Christian seems to have lost its meaning. It's kind of like the word love, right? I I love my wife. I love Twizzlers. I love people falling. I love my, my boy, right? I love Graham. I love Duck Dynasty. I love uh, f- uh, Friends. I love to read. I love the Dodgers. Go Dodgers. I love the movies. I love Chick-fil-A, except on Sundays I hate them. I love having the remote control. I love Costco samples. 
I love hot dogs. I love Jesus, right? The, the love has become such a neutered word that the love that, that we have begins to have some type of meaning. It loses all that meaning when it's expressed. Like, oh, the love for donuts is the love for the same love that I have for my son, right? Like that's kind of the way that we've deemed this word. I think the same is true when it comes to the word Christian, that, that, this, that this word has become so weakened, beaten down, made fun of, that the only real definition that a Christian has when it has action behind the definition. See, the word Christian, did you know, only appears three times in the Bible. And it's not even defined clearly. The term that people used who followed Jesus in the first century was the use to describe themselves as what? Disciple. See, now disciple, ooh, that's a terrifying term. Because a disciple is so clearly defined by, by scripture. A disciple is so clearly laid out for us of what it, the requirements of being a disciple means. That a Christian, you could be, you could be Christian and believe kind of anything. You could be a Christian and adopt any kind of lifestyle. Oh, I'm a Christian and, and, and this is just what, this is what I believe. Describe some form of Christian that supports your own decision. See, the difference between a Christian and a disciple, a Christian is all about what one believes. A disciple is about what a person actually does. Another way to look at it is that a Christian can often become an act. I'm going to believe it until it's an inconvenience for me and then I'm just not going to do it anymore. Or a disciple is always an action, meaning that I'm going to believe in Jesus and do the things that he's called me to do no matter what circumstances come my way. So you can look at this, a Christian is someone who believes in Jesus, but a disciple is someone who actually follows Jesus. See, a lot of people act like a Christian or assume that they're Christian because they're not a Muslim or a Buddhist or an atheist or any other ist that there is. Maybe they think they're Christian because they were born in America, which has always been such an interesting theory to me. Because I suppose that would mean that if you were born in a Starbucks, that would make you a Frappuccino. I don't know what that means. But the, but the act always ends. Someone who's acting a Christian, not a disciple. It always ends when things get tough because then God, it really shows where your faith stands. To continue on verse 67, it says, you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. See, this question Jesus asked, it's a tough one. It's a tough one for me. Because I really do think that if Jesus was asking this to his 12 disciples, the people that, that followed him so closely, that this is the same question when things get hard in our life that Jesus asks us. Do you not want to leave too? You don't want to leave too, do you? Do you want to walk away right now? See, what we do with this question will determine the rest of our life. See, are we playing and have the title of Christian or are we actually being an active disciple of Jesus? And my hope and my prayer, not only for me and for my church and the, and the people that I get to teach on a weekly basis, but my hope and my prayer for active church as well for, for those of you who are in this room is that you would answer like Peter does. That you would answer and respond to hard things just like Peter does, when, when Jesus seems to turn to us and says, do you want to leave? In verse 68, this is what he says. He says, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life that we have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. He says, Lord, like, where, where, should, where are we going to go? Where else are we going to go? We've left everything to follow you. See, his question is that when things get tough, that when we feel God doesn't matter, when our faith is on the line, that we have to ask the same question. Where will we go? Because here's what I've seen to be true, that if we do not turn to Jesus, we will turn to something else. If we don't turn to Jesus in the toughest moments of our lives, we will turn to something else. 
That many people have done this, but their, but their choices don't turn out as well as they thought. Like think about it, self-help, self-medicating, hanging out with the wrong people, making wrong, uh, think, the wrong thinking gets you deeper and deeper into a place that you've never actually intended for you to go in the first place. Some people go like, well, I'm just going to think positive all the time. And it's really hard to think positive all the time in a world that is so broken and dark. All you have to do is turn on the news and boom, positive thinking, gone. Some people think, well, if I just get what I want, well, I'll do whatever I can to be satisfied and get whatever I need to to feel satisfied. That I'll chase after that status, that power, that job, that woman, that man. I'll get this car. I'll get this house. If I get this thing or that person, I'm going to feel the way that I feel like I'm supposed to feel. Right? Do do, Do we do what we want to do and what we want to chase after or do we chase after and be a disciple of what Jesus calls us to do and do the things that he tells us to do? See, I think it comes down to this question. It says, am am I really willing to not do my plans? Or would I rather do what's best for me? That's the question that I kind of keep keep coming back to. Am I really willing not to do what I want to do? Or do I want to do what I feel is best for me? See, this is not only just a huge question. this This is a daily question. I hate this question. I hate this question because of how much I love my plans. My plans are freaking awesome. They are. The plans that I have, what I want to do with my life and the comfort that I have around me and the people that I place in front of me and the things that I choose to do, the places where I want to go and who I don't want to talk to or I do want to talk to, that my plans are great. I love my plans. They're wonderful. It makes me feel nice. And here's the tension. My natural plan springs from my selfishness. And I'm a very selfish person, I'm finding out. And I'm guessing that I'm not alone in this, am I? See, let me give you a glimpse into my selfishness, right? We've already established we could be transparent and honest. Just let me give you a glimpse of my selfishness. Um, Everyone at their house, you know this, you have a seat. You have a spot. It's your spot. It's no one else's spot. Mine, I have an L-shaped couch. Mine's in the corner of that couch. I just fit really nicely in there. I had friends over at my house. My friend was in my spot. And I had this inner dialogue in my head about should I tell him to move or not? Because it was my spot. And I remember having a conversation in my head of like, oh, he's in my spot. (laughs) Justin, he's a guest at your house. I don't care. It's my spot. No, Justin, he's a guest at your house. Guess what I did? I asked him to move. It's my house. It's my spot. (laughs) Right? Drive up to Chick-fil-A. Love Chick-fil-A. Except on Sundays. Drive up to Chick-fil-A. And I see, you know, when you get out of your car, I quickly get out and I see there's just a whole mob of people about to go into Chick-fil-A. What do I do? Quickly hurry to the door to get in front of them. Large fries and a large root beer with an Oreo shake after before all these people. Right? I need to get at home. And not only that, someone was in my booth at Chick-fil-A. So I picked up my tray and I just stared at him. Just stared him down. Mad dog. You're in, my, you're in my booth. Right? These are the kind of things that go through my head of selfishness. And I know I'm not alone. And here's the deal. That it's something that I've kind of been learning is that I'm not as selfish as I used to be. And as a disciple that I'm learning from Jesus more about my selfishness every single day and, and the how to release my plans for what Jesus has for me. And I'm also learning, and this is cool, that, that when I surrender my plans for his plans, that, that Jesus seems to support and reward those decisions. Because it's way easier to change your beliefs than it is to change your behavior. But a disciple of Jesus They'll do whatever is necessary in their life to follow what Jesus calls them to do. Even when things don't go our way, even when things aren't the best, am I going to do it my way or am I going to do what Jesus calls me to do? Let's go back to Peter's response because I love it as we kind of are wrapping up here that in verse 68, Simon Peter answered to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And Peter says, like, God, where do you want me to go at this point? God, I literally have left 
everything. Everyone's leaving. Things are tough. Where do you want me to go? He says, we believe and know that you're God and it's our, is your, and this is the question that we have to wrestle with. Is your response like Peter's in the toughest times? Is your response like, God, where else am I going to go? Because I've given everything for you. Because this is where the struggle is. We tend to drop our faith when things get hard. But our response, my hope and my prayer is that we could respond like Peter. Where else am I going to go? Lord, you're everything. See, why does he say this? I want to go back to the, the beginning of the passage where Jesus begins to teach and people are confronted with this teaching and that's when they started to disperse because look what Jesus says because it's, it's amazing when we are able to grasp some of this. It's in verse 30. And this is the crowd when it says, so they asked him, so the crowd who's been following him because he's been handing out free Chipotle burritos, right? So he's just saying, hey, what, what sign then will you give so that we can see it and believe in you? What will you do? And our ancestors ate manna from in the wilderness at his written that he gave them bread from heaven to he's talking they're referring back to Moses when they're in the in the desert and they were uh, God would provide manna for the Israelites to eat so that they could survive uh, in the desert. And Jesus said to them very truly I tell you it was not Moses who had given you the bread from heaven but it was my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And sir, they said, always give us this bread. And then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. That whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Amen on that. Right, did you guys know that I love food? I already mentioned that, right? As much as I love food, here's the thing about food and about thirst is that no matter how much I eat in one sitting, I'm always going to be hungry. Right? The, the physical part of me, I'm always going to be hungry for the next meal. The things that I'm taking in in my life, the th I mean, it's, it's not even food. Think about the things, the people, the status, whatever. I'm always chasing and I'm feeding myself with these things of this world. And I'm just always going to be wanting and craving more. And we're always going to be physically hungry. But this is the amazing thing about Jesus is that he says, spiritually, you come to me, you will never go hungry again. You will be full. The meaning and the, and the purpose and the life that I've called for you, you will never go hungry or thirsty again. When Socrates, the, the old ancient Greece philosopher, when he was at the height of his fame, a student approached him and said, hey, how can I be like you? Like this student, he wanted to be a disciple of Socrates and said, how, I want to do, I want to be like you. I want to be as wise as you. And Socrates said, hey, come follow me down to the ocean. And when they got there, Socrates said to the student, put your head in, under the water. And then Socrates held him there until the student almost drowned. And Socrates released him, and the student came up gasping for air. And then Socrates said, until you crave knowledge like you do air, you will never get it. Until we crave Jesus like air, we will never get it. That he is the bread of life. Sometimes, right? Sometimes. We don't understand that Jesus is the bread of life until our table is completely empty and that's the only thing that's left. Before he's the only thing that we have to eat from. Because the moment that we do, the moment that we turn to him, even the toughest times, the most difficult times, the most frustrating times, the emotional roller coasters, the anxieties, the stressors of life, Jesus is the bread of life. We will never go hungry again spiritually when we turn to him 
during those times that Jesus' words, it says, Peter knows this. He says, you have the words of life. And this is something that I've been like kind of wrestling with and kind of I've discovered about myself when it comes to Jesus and his words bring life that I would much rather, right? Wouldn't we much rather, I would much rather be in the valley of life with Jesus than on the mountain tops without him. I would much rather go through the darkest and deepest hurts of my life with Jesus next to me because he is the bread of life than have everything I've ever wanted without Jesus. Because here's the thing, and this is why I want you to get it, because Jesus didn't come to simply enhance your life with religious rules. He came to transform your life, to revolutionize your life, to empower your life to be something more, that he's called us to live something different. And he invites us into this incredible relationship, this incredible journey to follow him for a, re- a richer, deeper, more radical meaning for life, that Jesus, he is the word of life. He will walk through life with you, that he is for us, he is next to us, us, he sympathized with us, he empathized with us, and that he will not leave us in the darkest, most painful times of our lives. And this is why he matters. That this is why it's important to realize that it is easy to, to change what we believe than it is our behavior. But when we understand that following Jesus and what he calls us to do, when we grasp onto his words, because they are the words of life, that it matters. And it makes a difference. So the question I just kind of want to end with is that is your response like Peter? When things are tough, is your response, Lord, where else am I going to go? I've given you everything. Because if we don't turn to Jesus, we will turn to something else. So what, what is that response? Is your response like Peter? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you. God, I thank you that we get to to be here and we get to worship you. God, I pray that Active Church becomes a place where we respond in the way like Peter, when the things are tough, when things are not going our way, in whatever situation that's go, that you that life has brought us, God, that you have not disappeared, you're not away, you're not looking down at us, and just not being involved, God, that you're closer than ever. God, I pray the active church is, that they get to experience you like how I've experienced you in the, in the last three years where it just, God, it's just sometimes life just sucks. But God, I pray that our response is like Peter. God, whom shall we go to? You are God. You're the bread of life. You give life. Where am I gonna go? God, help us turn to you. Help us cling on to your words. Help us cling on to the, your eternal words. Help us not turn our eye from you. God, in a world where it's way easier to drop what we believe, to change what we believe, than it is to change our behavior. God, I pray the active church becomes disciples of you, that no matter what life throws their way, God, they're, they're, they're dedicated to your words and to the calling on their life that you've laid out for them. God, we pray this in your name. Amen.